Thanks very much, Christian. So my name is Nick Philpot. I'm one of the co-founders of Sodium Markets, an OTC brokerage owned by Standard Chartered Bank. Um, so to get the panel started off, I think we'll do uh, some introductions from all five of our panelists. So uh, Lily, would you like to start, please? And we'll go from right to left. Sure. Uh, my name is Lily. I'm the president of the Solana Foundation. Uh, Stablecoins payments um, are a big priority for us. Uh, I've been doing crypto for about 10 years, and uh, I was originally inspired by the kind of vision of Bitcoin, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, electronic cash. And to me, that implied uh, a global payment system by Accenture and global financial system uh, based on self-custody and self-sovereignty. I think that 15 years on, that vision has been uh, still a little bit more uh, articulated in theory rather than in practice because uh, there are a few conditions you need to have to start to realize that. One is that you need um, high performance uh, network. You've got to have liquidity and assets that people actually want to use as a medium of exchange, hence stable coins. Uh, and then third, you need to have a developer community to be, take it from you know, payments into actual sort of financial primitives and products. And so you know, none of that is easy to build, uh, but I think that now we're kind of at a point where we can start to actually realize that original vision that Bitcoin proposed. Hey everyone, my name is John. I'm head of business development at JST Digital. We are crypto native trading firm focused on market making, treasury management, and deploying our own capital as a strategic venture investor. Um, in terms of my background, I had started as an emerging markets FX and equity trader and you know, saw a lot of the issues in the legacy financial system that kind of my hobby of crypto drew me towards this industry. I started working at Circle in 2018 and um, had no turning back at this point in crypto for me. And it's been great working with stablecoin issuers in a variety of perspectives of trying to provide liquidity, create fair and orderly markets for um, all the efficiency gains that we see that stablecoins can provide both for crypto native firms, but also legacy financial institutions. Hey, I'm uh, Colin Cunningham. I'm the head of tokenization at Chainlink. Uh, I've been there all of one month now. Uh, <laughs> so still getting my head around the product set. Um, but my mandate is to try and figure out from a from a product and ecosystem perspective, um, how should Chainlink be fitting into the entire tokenization landscape um, and helping bring a, a more secure and verified um, kind of structure to how tokenized assets are um, transacted on chain. Obviously, stable coins play a big part in that. Uh, before that, I was at Centrifuge. I was there for three years. Centrifuge, if you don't know, it's a tokenization platform built in Polkadot. Um, and I led the BD and growth there. Um, so excited to be here, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, hi, my name is Matthew De La Fuente. I'm the CEO of Kayax. We're a financial reporting tool for crypto businesses. With regards to stable coins, so in December of 2012, I discovered Bitcoin and thought it was the most stupid idea ever because what government would ever allow a currency to exist that they couldn't control, manage, tax, and govern. And even now, when I look at blockchain as a whole, stablecoins to me seem like the killer app. Stablecoins seem like the obvious use case for the world, for you know the places where currency security is a real challenge and I'm delighted that Kayax has found real uh, traction amongst a whole bunch of stablecoin providers that are either linked to governments or are not linked to governments. Morning, uh, my name is Stefan Dreyer, Managing Director at the Association of National Numbering Agencies, also known as ANA. Um, so we are a global trade association uh, where our 120 members represent uh, key uh, market infrastructures, exchanges, central banks, uh, regulators. Um, so we come really out of the, the traditional uh, financial world uh, experience of 40 years assigning uh, standard identifiers out of the ISO universe to financial and referential instruments. Uh, you may have heard of the ISIN. Um, so unlike my colleagues uh, here on the panel, not coming uh, to this conversation from a practitioner point of view, but really looking at what are the things from a standards perspective that we can bring from traditional finance into the, the crypto space. Um, and we've done a lot of work over the last several months, particularly working with our partners at the DTI Foundation, which is the Digital Token Identifier Foundation, coupling that with ISIN to provide uh, a market solution for unique identification of assets. 
So we'll start with our first question, and I'll start with you, Stefan. Um, if you look at, I'm uh, probably already out of date here, but there's probably about two dozen currencies that have stable coins attached to them. Some of them, counterintuitively, are actually fairly unstable currencies. You know, the Argentine peso, the Nigerian naira, for example. So looking at terminology, is stablecoin really the right term that we should be using? And what would be the appeal of having something attached to something that's inherently unstable? Um, yes, it probably is the wrong term. I think what ends up happening is you have these kind of things that come out when, when you have a novelty, somebody puts a label against it, but it be very quickly becomes outdated because you start having variations of that. Um, it's hard to lose that lingo, but I think what is important is that, you know, I talked about identification, one of the other aspects that we work on is classification, and particularly in the regulatory space, it's going to be about what is this thing and what does it do um, that's going to really make the, the determination. So even if people are going to continue to refer to things more broadly as stable coins, you're going to have variations within there. Uh, I think I would probably agree with regards to stable coins as a category. I think it makes perfect sense from a marketing perspective. I think that technically there's a real, real challenge because inside of those stable coins, the mechanisms are so different. And if we are looking at traditional financial regulations, it's actually the mechanisms that should be regulated. It's the mechanisms that should evaluate what type of product this is. Um, and I think that there's going to be a real uh, reckoning when stablecoin truly hits uh, a regulatory wall. Um, from the tokenization perspective, I, it's absolutely the wrong name, but uh, from, <laughs> from my history, like we, the, we, we call them real world assets, right? Also, right, which is also a terrible name. Um, <laughs> makes no sense to TradFi, right? From a risk weighted assets uh, perspective, um, which is always been a fun conversation. So um, stablecoin, in, in my opinion, is the wrong term. And it's especially for the, the transaction of tokenized assets, it, we need something that is actually stable, right? I think um, we can all agree that there's a wide range of what stable means um, and how that's interpreted across geographies and across different markets. Um, I do think that it's okay that the stable coins have different risk parameters and serve different uh, needs for different folks in different uh, market contexts. But um, yeah, from the tokenized assets perspective, we'd like it to actually be stable. So I think there's a lot of work to do to just, um, I think the underlying mechanics, as you said, right, is probably where we need to get a little more clarity. Yeah, I guess maybe I'll be the contrarian here. I, I do think it's a fine term in the sense that it should be a stable coin should be stable to the fiat asset that is theoretically underpinning it. Um, you know, ultimately, Fiat FX is quite volatile, and I think some of the name stablecoin comes from the fact that the early stablecoins were US dollar stablecoins, and a lot of people in this room have done great work of expanding the suite of what's out there. Um, you know, ultimately, we look at something like, and maybe this is going to get controversial getting into this topic already, but what's happening in Nigeria right now, where they're pushing back on crypto companies because ultimately crypto companies are enabling local people to take a view on a currency that the government doesn't want. To me, that's an awesome use case of crypto, but also points to the instability of fiat FX. Uh, yeah, you know, it's just, um, <clears throat> the stable coins is not, uh, it's just a representation of however high quality or low quality that asset actually is. Uh, and what that's a reflection on is uh, essentially sort of good or bad governance, and most of the governance in the world is terrible, right? So that's not the stablecoin's fault. Uh, it's reflecting uh, much deeper ills uh, that, frankly, is probably uh, the reality that most of the people in the world live in, and frankly, you know, even here in the Western world, right? Uh, we're sort of living on the fumes of our former greatness. How many people here think that the dollar is going to have a debt crisis in our lifetime? Probably everyone. Uh, and so what it really is, it's kind of like a, uh, it's, a it's a transitional, um, uh, it's a transitional sort of uh, product for crypto adoption uh, because what you need is you need liquidity in a shared medium of exchange. And unfortunately, in Nigeria, that is the Naira, which depletes your wealth day by day. In Turkey, that is the Lira. Uh, and we even have, we had what, seven, nine percent inflation in the supposedly stable Western world as well. How's that going? Uh, so, you know, that's, uh, to me, stable coins are the first uh, tokenized asset, if you will. And there's many other tokenized assets um, of all sorts and of all ranges. 
and many of them are uh, going to be inherently unstable and get rugged, and many of them are going to go to zero. Uh, so, uh, you know, to me, that's it's just sort of the most viable medium of exchange uh, that can be providing liquid collateral, and that is also a little bit sort of self-reinforcing in terms of whether it has inherent value on chain. Uh, and so, what it really is doing is uh, it's creating these sort of you know, uh, these globally competitive markets that are essentially sort of a proxy vote on the quality of governance. And unfortunately, I think most governance fail at that. I think that to the global nature of it, I think it's very, very interesting. And you touched on the dollar there briefly. I think mean, a lot of people forget that there are two types of dollar. There's the domestic dollar and then there's the euro dollar, which we've had since sort of the 1950s. Um, and I know parallels have been drawn between, say, USDC or US issued coins on the one hand being sort of US dollars and then something like Tether being an offshore dollar. Perhaps, Matthew, I'll, I'll come to you. Do you have any sort of comments or thoughts on that? And then to the wider panel. Sure. So with regards to onshore and offshore stable coins, uh, let's just assume that onshore means that the company that you have set up, the foundation that you've set up to issue those stable coins is actually located in the jurisdiction and governed by the jurisdiction uh, of that native currency and offshore applies to everything else. The, the sheer scale of financial products that we have yet to see and yet to build is staggering. If you look at FX as a proxy, I believe nine, nine and a half trillion dollars was traded yesterday. Um, and the entire market cap of our entire industry, you know, probably what, two and a half trillion? Yeah. Um, we've got a long way to go. We have got so much space to innovate into. We've got so many variations to build that this conversation has only just begun. We are such a uh, young industry. The regulation hasn't caught up. The market space hasn't matured. The VCs haven't invested where they could. Um, I'm just incredibly excited about where we're going to go. Why group, Stefan? Maybe you'll have a go. Whether there, well, there's a greater need for it to see, I think it's all a perspective. You know, uh, where you're coming from, from the issuer side, from the investor side, from the regulator perspective, um, and you know, what is the benefit of understanding whether it's onshore, or offshore? Like Matthew just said, I think it, very much in, in that vein. But whether a greater distinctions needs probably personal personal preference. Okay, well, so we've sort of crossed geographical frontiers. I mean, let's perhaps cross digital frontiers and look at execution. So maybe, Colin, do you want to touch on or give us an idea of some of the challenges, some of the risks involved, some of the difficulties in terms of execution and settlement between CFI and DeFi? And if there are nuances specific to stable coins, then perhaps touch on that as well. When I think about the blockchain just globally and the reason it exists, and I think it goes back to what you were saying, is the idea of cross-border payments, right, is kind of the the killer use case in my my opinion. I think it's still foundational for where I think the stablecoins sit, right? Um, so when I think about tokenized assets, and I would agree, right, the stablecoin is probably the original, the, the foundational tokenized asset. Um, and it helps me look at it a bit more holistically if I just think about it as tokenized asset rather than currency. Um, from the settlement perspective, I think as long as, as when I look at stable coins in that context of cross-border payments, it's undeniable. When we talk about how central banks will get involved, or we talk about how you know traditional FMIs and institutions will get involved, um, you know the idea of instant settlement, cross-border settlement, and the stable coins use case in that perspective, I think when we keep it that simple and that focused, it makes it very interest, very simple for TradFi to understand the value proposition. Um, I think when we start getting into the underlying mechanics, um, the variations in what a stable coin is or does, or even the concepts of governance, I think Tradvi just goes, whoa, that's a lot. Um, um, Speaking about your experience with Swift. Yeah. I, I just think, I think it just, it takes, it takes you down a rabbit hole of, well, did you consider this? Did you consider that? Do you know, it's like, well, I, yeah, well, we can work through that. Um, and I think everyone just goes, yeah, this is too much. But when we talk about, you know, everything that's happening around, you know, kind of the FX markets, um, you talk about cross-border settlement, you talk about how um, the instantaneous and kind of undeniable and immutable nature of smart contracts and cross-border payments I think it is the one common thread that everyone can get on board with between CFI, DeFi, TradFi, any FI. 
Um, it's, and that's why stable coins are so important to the conversation because they're so uniting, especially in the payments uh, realm. John? Yeah, I think, you know, from a crypto practitioner perspective, I see it as a bit of a trade-off with the CeFi DeFi of almost transparency versus efficiency in that centralized exchanges work pretty well most of the time, um, but you are oftentimes trading with a bit of a black box. We've obviously had some counterparty issues in our industry that a lot of people didn't foresee. Um, in DeFi, you deal with some technical burdens that you have to be very aware of, protocol risk, smart contract risk, which um, you know, we talk about from a trading perspective are oftentimes difficult to underwrite because they're binary. And so you take those trade-offs for the fact that you have a level of transparency that you don't have with closed source code. And that's, to me, kind of the original ethos of crypto, which is pretty amazing. And um, we're big believers in DeFi, we're big believers in stable coins, roll it within DeFi, but it, you do have to approach it from a measured perspective of measuring those risks I already mentioned, working with folks like the chain monitoring tools, the elliptics, the chain analysis, the TRMs to make sure that you're on the right side of AML and OFAC regulations that are going to continue to be a major topic. Um, so, you know, again, it goes back to that transparency versus efficiency and going in open-eyed to what your trade-offs are and how to manage some of those risks that I mentioned on the DeFi side. <clears throat> Uh, so I think that uh, it's not just about payments even, where this can go very quickly is because if you think about it, these are all tokenized assets. And so if you can tokenize a dollar, you can also tokenize Apple stock and you can eventually, but even before you get there, you can tokenize, uh, we were talking about whiskey casks earlier. And so then if all of that is tokenized in the same fungible technology standard, then what you can do is I can pay you not just in dollars or Naira, I can pay you in shares of my uh, whiskey warehouse. Uh, and that is where I think uh, governments are going to totally lose it, right? Because uh, if I can now pay for my coffee with, a, with some fracture of Apple stock, this is not what regulators are at all prepared to be processing, right? But that is really sort of where we're going to be going. And I think that also changes the dynamics of what it means to be making these markets, right? Because if you have the ability to pay for coffee with Apple stock, then you know how do you even like, just imagine what needs to happen in, you know between dexes and centralized exchanges as well just imagine what has to happen in order to bring efficiency uh in arbing out that market to sort of uh to keep prices uh, uh as they should be uh so that to me is like the, the wild kind of future that we're going to be going into faster than we know it and you know to me i think that the uh the regulatory sort of face off with crypto is uh, there will be no, uh, I think, sort of congenial settlement, haha, as it were, of that, uh, because inherently what crypto pr uh, proposes is a competitive uh, governance uh, market, right? A competitive market for governance, and this is uh, proxy expressed in uh, stablecoin. Uh, let's say all of the all of the fiat currencies in the world were all represented. Uh, on chain. Would the distribution in the digital world reflect the distribution in the fiat world? Of course not, because you're going to have all this flight to safety of the US dollar, right? Uh, and that's not just because of liquidity, it's also because of the security of that asset, which is probably the one thing which will uh, probably stave off, uh, stave off sort of the US's fiscal predicament in the moment. Uh, and so given that, I, I think those of us that are thinking that we're kind of going to, you know, all kind of work it out within existing regulatory frameworks, I, I, I think that's just very unlikely. It's very interesting. I, I went to university in Scotland and thinking that if, if they get independence, perhaps a whiskey-backed currency could be on the cards. Um, uh, uh, yes, yes. Now we can yes. talk about digital gold and consumption <laughs> versus <laughs> store value. And so it's very a different very, concept yes, of market uh, liquidity uh, as well. Very different type of discussion there. So anyway, sorry, uh, Matthew, do you want to have a go at the question as well? No, I think I'm the person getting to know. That's fair enough. Okay. Um, so maybe, John, I'll come to you. So in terms of booking, I remember the 2018 Standard Chartered, quite an old bank. We did a test trade using Bitcoin, and we watched it go through, like, you know, the Indiana Jones wrecking ball, destroying every system it touched, including the general ledger. Um, so what tools do you need to be able to, to book, to manage the risk of, to execute, to settle uh, digital assets and stable coins? Perhaps we'll start with you. Yeah, you know, for, and I can speak again from working in a few different shops at this point, but having specific tooling to monitor that entire life cycle. At this point, 
you know, there's a lot of people building a lot of great products, but it's still disparate. There isn't one, in my opinion, if anyone has it, would love to chat later, killer app for institutional um, OMS, PMS, that's order management, um, portfolio management software. But I think, you know, taking a step back, thinking back to my traditional finance life, as everyone here who's worked in big banks has probably remembered, the systems are cobbled together. The experience that you went through was because things have been built over the last 30 years and it's been, you know, everything works, but it kind of works. It's all duct taped together and it's moving trillions of dollars of value every day. I think ultimately for stable coins to be adopted by traditional financial institutions, they're going to need to see that the benefits to them outweigh the costs of undoing a lot of what they've built to enable crypto to not go through this wrecking ball that you guys experienced. And again, it, it's kind of the classic buy versus build versus partner. And in that regard, it's almost like tra traditional firms need to realize they can partner with crypto by adopting into their systems. So. Stefan? Yeah, um, I would say that, yes, the tools are bulky and, and taped together, but um, the, I would say that for crypto, you need the same tools. You need to be able to do the same type of exercises. You need to do it in a different way. Um, you know, data management, risk management, you need those for transparency, regulatory reporting. You're gonna have a lot of the same requirements uh, that you do in, with traditional assets. I think the, and I'm gonna do a selfish plug here for standards, standards is another tool, right? You have to have something that threads all of that. Um, that helps create that interoperability so that you know that the, the, the asset that you're looking at going through that life cycle is the, is the same one. And uh, if we look at the, the DPI, that becomes the novelty um, in defining that asset to be able to look at what is exactly happening at the DLT implementation level. Um, so definitely, I think standards as well. Uh, John, uh, I agree with you. And I think everyone here understands that we're all going to have to build an equivalent stack in digital assets as we have done for TradFi. Um, I fear it's going to look as cobbled together, as vampiric, as hacked together on Google Sheets, as uh, TradFi is hacked together on Excel, but that's my own concern. I think for everyone here, the most interesting use case that we've actually had is what I've called accidental crypto. It is non-financial uh, non services companies. These are traditional businesses. Think Hamleys, think um, you know, your uh, local hardware store who've accidentally decided to accept Bitcoin, who've accidentally decided to accept a stable coin because of course USDC, yes, I understand it's the same as USD and okay, we'll accept it and the finance team gets bullied by the salespeople to accept the payment in USDC because this particular customer has special needs. And the finance stack then accepts that they have to deal with USDC. And then all bets are off. They have to systematically build, accept, buy an entirely new stack to deal with this single asset that has dropped in their ecosystem. They have to build or you know, find a way to store that asset through custody. They have to find a way to report on it. They have to find a way to reconcile it. They have to find a way to jam it into their accounting systems. They then have to find a way to either sell it or store it. I'm gonna tell you that the vast majority of our customers who fall in this accidental crypto space simply store it because the finance folks are so scared about getting it wrong. And that opportunity, that mega trend, may be a significant one, especially on the stablecoin side. Lily, I'll, I'll probably bring the next question to you. Um, so in terms of taking finance on chain, effectively putting it on the internet for the first time ever, I mean, what, what do you th how do you think that's gonna transform traditional finance? And what do you think that we're gonna find that's you know, perhaps, as Matthew was yeah. saying, is unexpected? Yeah, so I think um, even before you get into, let's call it very novel assets, I'm gonna use the whiskey examples, like kind of, you know, that's, uh, before you even get there, let's just talk about the assets that we all kind of know and love. Uh, uh, you know, stocks, bonds, credit products, that type of thing, money markets, right? That's what everyone's into right now. Uh, I think that um, because of 
uh, the, the kind of the very near term uh, case for call it tokenization and securitization is that in the current system, um, because you operate on stacks of paper, right? Um, just the operational nature of being able to economically reach, sell, and execute um, a market uh, related to a certain audience is, is limited, right? Which is part of the reason why you have uh, minimum thresholds to be accepted as a private wealth client, you have minimum investment thresholds to get into certain alternative investment products, uh, and, uh, and then, you know, sort of access of, you know, certain, certainly sort of the middle or even the longer tail uh, to varying degrees of, uh, of financial products uh, is increasingly limited the more sort of nouveau you get uh, and or uh, you know, and, and that's just kind of the way it is, right? So if you want to be, uh, who gets to be an LP into KKR North American Fund, right? Very few people. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, they would actually like that uh, potential investor base to be larger and more liquid, right? Of course, with some discretion. Uh, and, and then there's certainly a long tail of folks that would like to have some, you know, fractional, uh, fractional access to that, but it's just not practical for that market to even be executed because the way it goes right now is, you know, you have uh, the client partner group go and pitch a bunch of LPs for tens of millions minimum of dollars, right? And there isn't a way to sort of open that up in a way which is operationally feasible. Uh, and so to me, it's a little bit sort of iPhone, uh, Uber, now you can clear a market of riders and drivers real time and a much smaller scale. Uh, and uh, and then, but in, ag in aggregate, um, open up a much or create a much larger market. And so I think you know, near term, those are the types of things that become uh, very feasible. I think people really see that in uh, in sort of like this next horizon. And then what I think becomes interesting is the ability to, for example, uh, take my uh, soul bound token, whatever non transferable uh, assets in. Uh, in let's call it a private equity fund, and then uh, and then the banks can uh, seamlessly lend to me against you know let's call it ten thousand dollars in this fund asset, and then I can easily get a loan for five thousand. Right, those are the types of things you like you literally can't even do on Web two because of uh, because of sort of clarity around ownership and then sort of liquidity of of, of an ease of transfer. So those are the types of things that um, I think are uh, I can see the value in it very clearly. Um, I think those mechanisms ideally are going to be put in place. Uh, and even if it's not sort of, you know, like the more novel end of the world, uh, I think that will be valuable to a number of people uh, and will actually be like a fairly happy collaboration between blockchain and traditional finance uh, initially. Uh, and, you know, I think there are a lot of crypto peers who are like, it's just going to be Bitcoin taking over the world, okay? And uh, we should dominate the world in Satoshi. So I don't disagree with that eventually. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, we have to be cognizant of the fact that the vast majority of liquidity is sitting in the existing financial system, uh, and we need to be practical about that. So uh, last two minutes, John, I'll come to you and then go through the others. But in terms of use cases or transformation, evolution, revolution, what's exciting you most in terms of state points? <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, I'm going to go super micro and simplistic, and it's things that are not currently possible with the fiat banking rails in that we made a venture investment a few weeks ago. It's a very small company, needed the cash immediately. For whatever reason, they had, their bank had an issue with them receiving our wire. They reached out and said, hey, our bank hasn't been receiving any of our wires. And we said, hey, can we just send you USDC? And they said, of course. Within five minutes, they have their investment. They can meet payroll. They can fund their AWS costs, whatever it is. And to me, that's so obvious of where the legacy financial system has not kept up and where stable coins are just an immediate potential boon to, again, this is an ex just one small example of supporting a startup that, you know, without even going way more macro of what this could do for far more complicated transactions, it's really exciting and, you know, it's a big reason why at JST we're big believers in stable coins, big believers in what this ecosystem can do, and uh, very excited to see what happens in the next few years. Colin? Um, yeah, so I think I'm most excited about the transparency that we can bring to stable coins um, by better understanding the underlying collateral. Um, you know, we, I don't have, we don't have time to get into this, but just I think most people understand just how much of the collateral is sitting off chain and kind of custodian and various. Um, you know, holding accounts, and we're getting reporting on this typically monthly or quarterly, right? What I start to get really excited about 
is when we talk about bringing more of the collateral on chain, more of the data on chain, so that we can start to understand not only the, the NAV or the price of the, the asset that you're investing in, um, but understanding the performance of the underlying on a, on a daily basis, um, if not more frequently. So that's where I start to get really excited. Matthew, and then finally, Stefan. Uh, the honest answer is pretty much everything. Um, I think that once more currencies get on chain, once more counterparties start engaging with trading, uh, start moving towards um, FX initiatives, which I know Nick is, uh, is helping lead, I think that not only will that be a huge boon to the stablecoin industry, but I think it will probably transform the way traditional finance looks at this industry as a whole. Um, FX is one of the closest analogy industries to crypto in general. Um, and once those traders get a taste for what, you know, uh, stablecoin FX can do for them, um, I have a strong suspicion that this industry will um, have another significant bull run, and I'm here for it. Yeah, so when I uh, started in my role four years ago, I knew zero uh, other than, you know, the, the man on the street, Bitcoin, blockchain, heard those terms before. Um, but there was a common uh, kind of theme that there was lack of regulatory clarity. Not much was happening to bring things together. And I would say that certainly um, from my observation in the last uh, six months to 12 months, there's been a huge trajectory in the, in the evolution of crypto regulation. You see it in Hong Kong, you've got Mika coming into force. So all of that is providing this positive tailwind. And I, you see a lot of the, the traditional firms moving out of the, the cobwebs and corners to look at these projects, look and building their own platforms, coming together with new organizations that are very focused and specialized in the crypto space. And I think that you know, is a tremendous tailwind to, to developing uh, greater interoperability. You've got the efficiency gains, you've got new investment opportunities. Um, all of that comes with risks, new risks that have to be carefully watched, but I think a very positive uh, outlook. Fantastic. And on that positive note, we'll close the panel. Thank you very much to my panelists. Um, and thank you to Chainlink and the Stainbull Coin Standard. And look forward to following up and chatting outside over a coffee. Thank you. Thank you.